Not far thence is the secret garden in which grew like strange flowers the kinds of sleep, so different one from the other, the sleep induced by Datura, by the multiple extracts of ether, the sleep of belladonna, of opium, of valerian, flowers whose petals remain shut until the day when the predestined visitor shall come and, touching them, bid them open, and for long hours inhale the aroma of their peculiar dreams into a marveling and bewildered being. Proust, Remembrance of Things Past Avis knew she wasn't really as sick as Dr. Clegg had said. She was merely bored with living. The death impulse, perhaps. Then again, it might have been nothing more than her distaste for clever young men who persisted in addressing her as Olara Avis. She felt better now, though. The fever had settled until it was no more than one of the white blankets which covered her, something she could toss aside with a gesture if it wasn't so pleasant just to burrow into it, to snuggle deeply within its confining warmth. Avis smiled as she realized the truth. Monotony was the one thing that didn't bore her. The sterility of excitement was the really jading routine, after all. This quiet, uneventful feeling of restfulness seemed rich and fertile by comparison, rich and fertile, creative, womb. The words linked, back to the womb, dark room, warm bed, lying doubled up in the restful, nourishing lethargy of fever. It wasn't the womb, exactly. She hadn't gone back that far, she knew. But it did remind her of the days when she was a little girl, just a little girl with big round eyes mirroring the curiosity that lay behind them, just a little girl living all alone in a huge old house, like a fairy princess in an enchanted castle. Of course, her aunt and uncle had lived here too, and it wasn't a really, truly castle, and nobody else knew that she was a princess. Except Marvin Mason, that is. Marvin had lived next door, and sometimes he'd come over and play with her. They would come up to her room and look out of the high window, the little round window that bordered on the sky. Marvin knew that she was a sure enough princess, and he knew that her room was an ivory tower. The window was an enchanted window, and when they stood on a chair and peeked out, they could see the world behind the sky. Sometimes, she wasn't quite sure if Marvin Mason honest and truly saw the world beyond the window. Maybe he just said he did because he was fond of her. But he listened very quietly when she told him stories about that world. Sometimes she told him stories she had read in books, and other times she made them up out of her very own head. It was only later that the dreams came, and she told him those stories, too. That is, she always started to, but somehow the words would go wrong. She didn't always know the words for what she saw in those dreams. They were very special dreams. They came only on those nights when Aunt May left the window open, and there was no moon. She would lie in the bed all curled up in a little ball, and wait for the wind to come through the high, round window. It came quietly, and she would feel it on her forehead and neck, like fingers stroking. Cool, soft fingers, stroking her face, soothing fingers that made her uncurl and stretch out so that the shadows could cover her body. Even then, she slept in the big bed, and the shadows would pour down from the window in a path. She wasn't asleep when the shadows came so she knew they were real. They came on the breeze, from the window, and covered her up. Maybe it was the shadows that were cool and not the wind. Maybe the shadows stroked her hair until she fell asleep. But she would sleep then, and the dreams always came. They followed the same path as the wind and the shadows. They poured down from the sky through the window. There were voices she heard but could not understand, colors she saw but could not name. Shapes she glimpsed, but which never seemed to resemble any figure she found in picture books. Sometimes the same voices and colors and shapes came again and again until she learned to recognize them, in a way. There was the deep, buzzing voice that seemed to come from right inside her own head, although she knew it really issued from the black, shiny pyramid thing that had the arms with eyes in it. It didn't look slimy or nasty, and there was nothing to be afraid of. Avis could never understand why Marvin Mason made her shut up when she started telling about those dreams. But he was only a little boy, and he got scared and ran to his mommy. Avis didn't have any mommy, only Aunt May, but she would never tell Aunt May such things. Besides, 
Why should she? The dreams didn't frighten her, and they were so very real and interesting. Sometimes, on gray, rainy days when there was nothing to do but play with dolls or cut out pictures to paste in her album, she wished that night would hurry up and come, then she could dream and make everything real again. She got so she liked to stay in bed and would pretend to have a cold so she didn't have to go to school. Avis would look up at the window and wait for the dreams to come. But they never came in the daytime, only at night. Often she wondered what it was like up there. The dreams must come from the sky. She knew that. The voices and shapes lived way up, somewhere beyond the window. Aunt May said that dreams came from tummy aches, but she knew that wasn't so. Aunt May was always worried about tummy aches, and she scolded Avis for not going outside to play. She said she was getting pale and puny. But Avis felt fine, and she had her secret to think of. Now she scarcely ever saw Marvin Mason anymore, and she didn't bother to read. It wasn't much fun to pretend she was a princess, either, because the dreams were ever so much more real, and she could talk to the voices and ask them to take her with them when they went away. She got so she could almost understand what they were saying. The shiny thing that just hung through the window now, the one that looked like it had so much more to it she couldn't see, it made music inside her head that she recognized. Not a real tune, more like words in a rhyme. In her dreams, she asked it to take her away. She would crawl up on its back and let it fly with her up over the stars. That was funny, asking it to fly, asking it to fly. But she knew that the part beyond the window had wings, wings as big as the world. She begged and pleaded, but the voices made her understand that they couldn't take little girls back with them. That is, not entirely. Because it was too cold and too far, and something would change her. She said she didn't care how she changed. She wanted to go. She would let them do anything they wanted if only they would take her. It would be nice to be able to talk to them all the time and feel that cool softness to dream forever. One night, they came to her, and there were more things than she had ever seen before. They hung through the window and in the air all over the room. They were so funny, some of them. You could see through them, and sometimes one was partially inside another. She knew she giggled in her sleep, but she couldn't help it. Then she was quiet and listening to them. They told her it was all right. They would carry her away, only she mustn't tell anyone and she mustn't be frightened. They would come for her soon. They couldn't take her as she was, and she must be willing to change. Ava said yes, and they all hummed a sort of music together and went away. The next morning, Avis was well and truly sick and didn't want to get up. She could hardly breathe. She was so warm, and when Aunt May brought in a tray, she wouldn't eat a bite. That night, she didn't dream. Her head ached, and she tossed all night long. But there was a moon out, so the dreams couldn't get through anyway. She knew they would come back when the moon was gone again, so she waited. Besides, she hurt so that she didn't really care. She had to feel better before she was ready to go anywhere. The next day, Dr. Clegg came to see her. Dr. Clegg was a good friend of Aunt May's, and he was always visiting her because he was her guardian. Dr. Clegg held her hand and asked her what seemed to be the matter with his young lady today. Avis was too smart to say anything, and besides, there was a shiny thing in her mouth. Dr. Clegg took it out and looked at it and shook his head. After a while, he went away, and then Aunt May and Uncle Roscoe came in. They made her swallow some medicine that tasted just awful. By that time, it was getting dark, and there was a storm coming outside. Avis wasn't able to talk much, and when they shut the round window, she couldn't ask them to please leave it open tonight because there was no moon and they were coming for her. But everything kept going round and round, and when Aunt May walked past the bed, she seemed to flatten out like a shadow, or one of the things, only she made a loud noise, which was really the thunder outside, and now she was sleeping really and truly, even though she heard the thunder, but the thunder wasn't real. Nothing was real except the things. That was it. Nothing was real anymore but the things. And they came through the window. It wasn't closed after all because she opened it. And she was crawling out high up there where she had never crawled before. But it was easy without a body. And soon she would have a new body. They wanted the old one because they carried it. But she didn't care because she didn't need it. And now they would carry her. al nath Yogoth from Nomi Ilya. That was when Aunt May and Uncle Roscoe found her and pulled her down from the window. They said later she had screamed at the top of her voice. Or else she would have gone over without anyone noticing. After that, Dr. Clegg took her away to the hospital, where there were no high windows, and they came in to see her all night long. The dream stopped. 
When at last she was well enough to go back home, she found that the window was gone too. Aunt May and Uncle Roscoe had boarded it up because she was a somnambulist. She didn't know what a somnambulist was, but guessed it had something to do with her being sick and the dreams not coming anymore. For the dreams stopped then. There was no way of making them come back, and she really didn't want them anymore. It was fun to play outside with Marvin Mason now, and she went back to school when the new semester began. Now, without the window to look at, she just slept at night. Aunt May and Uncle Roscoe were glad, and Dr. Clegg said she was turning out to be a mighty fine little specimen. Avis could remember it all now as though it were yesterday, or today, or tomorrow. How she grew up. How Marvin Mason fell in love with her. How she went to college and they became engaged. How she felt the night Aunt May and Uncle Roscoe were killed in the crash at Leedsville. That was a bad time. An even worse time was when Marvin had gone away. He was in service now, overseas. She had stayed on all alone in the house, for it was her house now. Reba came in days to do the housework and Dr. Clegg dropped around, even after she turned 21 and officially inherited her estate. He didn't seem to approve of her present mode of living. He asked her several times why she didn't shut up the house and move into a small apartment downtown. He was concerned because she showed no desire to keep up the friendship she had made in college. Avis was curiously reminded of the solicitude she had exhibited during her childhood. But Avis was no longer a child. She proved that by removing what had always seemed to her a symbol of adult domination. She had the high round window in her room unboarded once more. It was a silly gesture. She knew it at the time, but somehow it held a curious significance for her. For one thing, it reestablished a linkage with her childhood, and more and more childhood came to epitomize happiness for her. With Marvin Mason gone and Aunt May and Uncle Roscoe dead, there was little enough to fill the present. Avis would sit up in her bedroom and pore over the scrapbooks she had so assiduously pasted up as a girl. She had kept her dolls and the old fairy tale books. She spent drowsy afternoons examining them. It was almost possible to lose one's time sense in such pastimes. Her surroundings were unchanged. Of course, Avis was larger now, and the bed wasn't quite as massive, nor the window as high. But both were there, waiting for the little girl that she became when, at nightfall, she curled up into a ball and snuggled under the sheets, snuggled and stared up at the high, round window that bordered the sky. Avis wanted to dream again. At first, she couldn't. After all, she was a grown woman, engaged to be married. She wasn't a character out of Peter Ibbotson, and those dreams of her childhood had been silly. But they were nice. Yes, even when she had been ill and nearly fallen out of the window that time, it had been pleasant to dream. Of course, those voices and shapes were nothing more but Freudian fantasies. Everyone knew that. Or did they? Suppose it was all real. Suppose dreams are not just subconscious manifestations caused by indigestion and gas pressure. What if dreams are really the product of electronic impulse? Or planetary radiations attuned to the wavelength of the sleeping mind? Thought is an electrical impulse. Life itself is an electrical impulse. Perhaps a dreamer is like a spiritualist medium, placed in a receptive state during sleep. Instead of ghosts, the creatures of another world or another dimension can come through if the sleeper is granted the rare gift of acting as a filter. What if the dreams feed on the dreamer for substance, just as spirits attain ectoplasmic being by draining the medium of energy? Avis thought and thought about it. And when she had evolved this theory, everything seemed to fit. Not that she would ever tell anyone about her attitude. Dr. Clegg would only laugh at her, or still worse, shake his head. Marvin Mason didn't approve either. Nobody wanted her to dream. They still treated her like a little girl. Very well. She would be a little girl, a little girl who could do as she pleased now. She would dream. It was shortly after reaching this decision that the dreams began again. Almost as though they had been waiting until she would fully accept them in terms of their own reality. Yes, they came back. Slowly, a bit at a time. Avis found that it helped to concentrate on the past during the day, to strive to remember her childhood. To this end, she spent more and more time in her room, leaving Reba to tend to housework downstairs. As for fresh air, she could always look out of her window. It was high and small, but she would climb on a stool and gaze up at the sky through the round aperture, watching the clouds that veiled the blue beyond and waiting for night to come. Then she would sleep in the big bed and wait for the wind. The wind soothed and the darkness slithered, and soon she could hear the buzzing, blurring voices. At first, 
only the voices came back, and they were faint and far away. Gradually, they increased in intensity, and once more she was able to discriminate, to recognize individual intonations. Timidly, hesitantly, the figures re-emerged. Each night they grew stronger. Avis Long, little girl with big round eyes in big bed below round window, welcomed their presence. She wasn't alone anymore. No need to see her friends or talk to that silly old Dr. Clegg. No need to waste much time gossiping with Reba or fussing over meals. No need to dress or venture out. There was the window by day and the dreams by night. Then, all at once, she was curiously weak, and this illness came. But it was all false, somehow, this physical change. Her mind was untouched. She knew that. No matter how often Dr. Clegg pursed his lips and hinted about calling in a specialist, she wasn't afraid. Of course, Avis knew he really wanted her to see a psychiatrist. The doddering fool was filled with glib patter about retreat from reality and escape mechanisms. But he didn't understand about the dreams. She wouldn't tell him, either. He'd never know the richness, the fullness, the sense of completion that came from experiencing contact with other worlds. Avis knew that now. The voices and shapes that came in the window were from other worlds. As a naive child, she'd invited them by her very unsophistication. Now, striving consciously to return to the childlike attitude, she again admitted them. They were from other worlds, worlds of wonder and splendor. Now they could meet only on the plane of dreams, but someday, someday soon, she would bridge the gap. They whispered about her body, something about the trip making the change. It couldn't be explained in their words. But she trusted them, and after all, a physical change was of slight importance contrasted with the opportunity. Soon she would be well again, strong again, strong enough to say yes, and then they would come for her when the moon was right. Until then, she could strengthen the determination and the dream. Avis Long lay in the great bed and basked in the blackness, the blackness that poured palpably through the open window. The shapes filtered down, wriggling through the warps, feeding upon the night, growing, pulsing, encompassing all. They reassured her about the body, but she didn't care, and she told them she didn't care, because the body was unimportant, and yes, she would gladly consider it an exchange if only she could go, and she knew she belonged, not beyond the rim of the stars, but between it, and among substance dwells that which is blackness in blackness, for Yogath is only a symbol. No, that is wrong, there are no symbols, for all is reality, and only perception is limited. Char Onyar Shagorinth. It is hard for us to make you understand, but I do understand. You cannot fight it. I will not fight it. They will try to stop you. Nothing shall stop me, for I belong. Yes, you belong. Will it be soon? Yes, it will be soon. Very soon. Yes, very soon. Marvin Mason was unprepared for this sort of reception. Of course, Avis hadn't written, and she wasn't at the station to meet him. But the possibility of her being seriously ill had never occurred to him. He had come out to the house at once, and it was a shock when Dr. Clegg met him at the door. The old man's face was grim and the tenor of his opening remark still grimmer. They faced each other in the library downstairs, Mason self-consciously diffident and khaki, the older man a bit too professionally brusque. "'Just what is it, doctor?' Mason asked. "'I don't know. Slight, recurrent fever, listlessness. I've checked everything. No TB, no trace of low-grade infection. Her trouble isn't... organic.' "'You mean there's something wrong with her mind?' Dr. Clegg slumped into an armchair and lowered his head. Mason, I could say many things to you. About the psychosomatic theory of medicine, about the benefits of psychiatry, about... But never mind, it would be sheer hypocrisy. I've talked to Avis. Rather, I've tried to talk to her. She won't say much, but what she does say disturbs me. Her actions disturb me even more. You can guess what I'm driving at, I think, when I tell you that she is leading the life of an eight-year-old girl. The life she did lead at that age. Mason scowled. Don't tell me she sits in her room again and looks out of that window. Dr. Clegg nodded. But I thought it was boarded up long ago because she's a somnambulist and she had it unboarded several months ago. And she is not, never was, a somnambulist. What do you mean? Avis Long never walked in her sleep. I remember the night she was found on that window's edge. Not ledge, for there is no ledge. She was perched on the edge of the open window, already halfway out, a little tyke hanging through the high window. But there was no chair beneath her. No ladder. No way for her to climb up. She was simply there. Dr. Clegg looked away before continuing. Don't ask me what it means. I can't explain, and I wouldn't want to. 
I'd have to talk about the things she talks about. The dreams and the presences that come to her. The presences that want her to go away. Mason, it's up to you. I can't honestly move to have her committed on the basis of material evidence. Confinement means nothing to them. You can't build a wall to keep out dreams. But you can love her. You can save her. You can make her well, make her take an interest in reality. Oh, I know it sounds mawkish and stupid, just as the other sounds wild and fantastic. Yes, it's true. It's happening right now. To her, she's asleep up in her room at this very moment. She's hearing the voices. I know that much. Let her hear your voice. Mason walked out of the room and started up the stairs. But what do you mean you can't marry me? Mason stared at the huddled figure in the swirl of bedclothes. He tried to avoid the direct stare of Avis Long's curiously childlike eyes, just as he avoided gazing up at the black, ominous aperture of the round window. I can't, that's all, Avis answered. Even her voice seemed to hold the childlike quality. The high, piercing tones might well have emanated from the throat of a little girl. A tired little girl half asleep and a bit petulant about being abruptly awakened. But our plans, your letters. I'm sorry, dear. I can't talk about it. You know I haven't been well. Dr. Clegg is downstairs. He must have told you. But you're getting better, Mason pleaded. You'll be up and around again in a few days. Ava shook her head. A smile. The secret smile of a naughty child clung to the corners of her mouth. You can't understand, Marvin. You never could understand. That's because you belong here. A gesture indicated the room. I belong somewhere else. Her finger stabbed unconsciously towards the window. Marvin looked at the window now. He couldn't help it. The round, black hole that led to nothingness. Or something. The sky outside was dark, moonless. A cold wind curled about the bed. Let me close the window for you, dear, he said, striving to keep his voice even and gentle. No, but you're ill. You'll catch cold. That isn't why you want to close it. Even in accusation, the voice was curiously piping. Ava sat bolt upright and confronted him. You're jealous, Marvin. Jealous of me. Jealous of them. You would never let me dream. You would never let me go. And I want to go. They're coming for me. I know why Dr. Clegg sent you up here. He wants you to persuade me to go away. He'd like to shut me up just as he wants to shut the window. He wants to keep me here because he's afraid. You're all afraid of what lies out there. Well, it's no use. You can't stop me. You can't stop them. Take it easy, darling. Never mind. Do you think I care what they do to me? If only I can go? I'm not afraid. I know I can't go as I am now. I know they must alter me. There are certain parts they want for reasons of their own. You'd be frightened if I told you, but I'm not afraid. You say I'm sick and insane. Don't deny it. Yet I'm healthy enough, sane enough to face them and their world. It's you who are too morbid to endure it all. Avis Long was wailing now. A thin, high-pitched wail of a little girl in a tantrum. You and I are leaving this house tomorrow, Mason said. We're going away. We'll be married and live happily ever after, in good old storybook style. The trouble with you, young lady, is that you've never had to grow up. All this nonsense about goblins and other worlds. Avis screamed. Mason ignored her. Right now, I'm going to shut that window, he declared. Avis continued to scream. The shrill ululation echoed on a sustained note as Mason reached up and closed the round pane of glass over the black aperture. The wind resisted his efforts, but he shut the window and secured the latch. Then her fingers were digging into his throat from the rear, and her scream was pouring down his ear. I'll kill you! She wailed. It was the wail of an enraged child. But there was nothing of the child, or the invalid, in the strength behind her clawing fingers. He fought her off, panting. Then... Suddenly, Dr. Clegg was in the room. A hypodermic needle flashed and gleamed in an arc of plunging silver. They carried her back to the bed. Tucked her in. The blankets nestled about the weary face of a child in sleep. The window was closed tightly now. Everything was in order as the two men turned out the light and tiptoed from the room. Neither of them said a word until they stood downstairs once again. Facing the fireplace, Mason sighed. Somehow I'll get her out of here tomorrow, he promised. Perhaps it was too abrupt, my coming back tonight and waking her. I wasn't very tactful. But something about her, something about that room, frightened me. Dr. Clegg lit his pipe. I know, he said. That's why I couldn't pretend to you that I completely understand. There's more to it than mere hallucination. I'm going to sit up here tonight, Mason continued, just in case something might happen. She'll sleep, Dr. Clegg assured him. No need to worry. I'll feel better if I stay. I'm beginning to get a theory about all this talk, 
other worlds and changes to her body before a trip. It ties in with the window somehow, and it sounds like a fantasy on suicide. The death impulse? Perhaps. I should have thought of that possibility. Dreams foreshadowing death. On second thought, Mason, I may stay with you. We can make ourselves comfortable here before the fire, I suppose. Silence settled. It must have been well after midnight before either of them moved from their place before the fire. Then, a sharp splinter of sound crashed from above. Before the tinkling echo died away, both men were on their feet and moving towards the stairway. There was no further noise from above, and neither of them exchanged a single word. Only the thud of their running footsteps on the stairs broke the silence, and as they paused outside Avis Long's room, the silence seemed to deepen in intensity. It was a silence palpable, complete, accomplished. Dr. Clegg's hand darted to the doorknob, wrenched it ineffectually. Locked, he muttered. She must have gotten up and locked it. Mason scowled. The window. Do you think she could have... Dr. Clegg refused to meet his glance. Instead, he turned and put his massive shoulder to the door panel. A bulge of muscle ridged his neck. Then the panel splintered and gave way. Mason reached out and opened the door from inside. They entered the darkened room. Dr. Clegg in the lead, fumbling for the light switch. The harsh, electric glare flooded the scene. It was a tribute to the power of suggestion that both men glanced not at the patient in the bed, but at the round window high up on the wall. Cold night air streamed through a jagged aperture where the glass had been shattered as through by the blow of a gigantic fist. Fragments of glass littered the floor beneath, but there was no trace of any missile. And obviously the bla- And obviously the glass had been broken from the other side of the pane. The window, Mason murmured weakly, but he could not look at Dr. Clegg as he spoke. For there was no wind, only the cold, soft breeze that billowed ever so gently from the nighted sky above, only the cold, soft breeze, rustling the curtains and prompting a saraband of shadows on the wall, shadows that danced in silence over the great bed in the corner. The breeze and the silence and the shadows enveloped them as they stared now at the bed. Avis Long's head was turned towards them on the pillow. They could see her face quite clearly, and Dr. Clegg realized on the basis of experience what Mason knew instinctively. Alice Long's eyes were closed in death. But that is not what made Mason gasp and shudder, nor did the sight of death alone cause Dr. Clegg to scream aloud. There was nothing whatsoever to frighten the beholder of the placid countenance turns towards them in death. They did not scream at the sight of Avis Long's face. Lying on the pillow of the huge bed, Avis Long's face bore a look of perfect peace. But Avis Long's body was gone.